what you're really here today is to listen to our experts. Uh, so I'll plunge in because you almost have to talk to me if we organize it. And I would like to share a few thoughts with you. And that will give us a chance for the other folks to drift in. And then we'll have critical mass. And we'll uh, all sit back and listen to this terrific panel. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time to join us for our industrial hemp forum. Uh, and we've got uh, some uh, insightful people that are going to be able to discuss with us the hemp movement nationwide. It's uh, history, the applications, the market today, and for me, most exciting is the opportunity, instead of having hemp that we have to import to the United States before we have the products, allow Oregon farmers and farmers around the country to cultivate it. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Christina Ogazi and Joy Mayer for helping us put together the exhibit out there. If you haven't taken time to kind of just look at the range that is, uh, that is available, I think it's, uh, I hope you do so on your way out. 20 states have passed pro-industrial hemp legislation. And more telling, 10 states including Oregon, have passed legislation that removed barriers to its production. Um, let me read them. California, Colorado, Kentucky, Maine, Montana, North Dakota, Oregon, Vermont, Washington, and West Virginia. Pretty wide range of states all across the country. Now, as I think most of you know, hemp products are perfectly legal today. There is a retail market in help and hemp products, we think is about half a billion dollars now. I frankly think that's understated. Uh, we've watched the estimates since I've been working on this, the estimates kind of go up about the range of the market. And I will tell you that I'm convinced if we're able to move forward with actual hemp cultivation, in Oregon and other states, I think that market is going to expand. The hemp, there'll be more competition for it, and it can be grown locally, not imported from Europe or Canada or Kamchatka or someplace. Um, so it's the supply line is shorter, and the competition is greater. So I think that means that it's going to have overall an opportunity to make hemp products even more competitive than they are now. Additionally, it's going to, I think the attention that is going to be directed as a result of what's going on in Oregon and other states, we're going to watch the expansion. So I think there will be more attention, more involvement, and I think you're going to see even more commercial applications. So from my point of view, um, it's gone from a, less than a third of a billion to a half billion, and I think uh, it's going to expand dramatically. You see some of the products out there. Uh, this is a hemp flag. Gerald Polis and I arranged for it to be flown over the United States Capitol on July 4th. <laughs> You know, it's, it's important to clear up the misconception. Industrial hemp, why don't you repeat after me? Industrial hemp is not marijuana. Right? Uh, you ought to practice that in other groups. Uh, you know, it's, it's really frustrating. There's less than a t three tenths of a percent of THC. It's not a drug. Now, we can argue about outdated drug laws anyway. I mean, is marijuana really worse than heroin and meth? But that's a debate for another day. We don't need to get into it. I don't want to get into it. I want to focus on him. Regardless of your view about other drug laws, this is not a drug. And we need to come together to help people understand that and what the opportunities are. I've been listening to people who've been cornering me for decades. 
Some of you have been stalking me in this room. <laughs> but, but the point has been well taken. And so we've been working as part of a whole range of issues in Congress to get this thing off the table. Get it passed. Get it accepted. Now, part of what's uh, interesting for me is that the controversy surrounding marijuana is going to help us sweep through some of the misconceptions. Um, as you know, 21 states and the District of Columbia have legalized medical marijuana. Over 110 million people live in states that have medical marijuana where it's legal. And this fall, two states, Washington and Colorado, voted to legalize adult recreational use of marijuana. What happened is it set up, this has set up an interesting conflict with federal law. And again, not debating the merits one way or another, that's an issue. But President Obama famously said when, when challenged, is the Department of Justice going to be prosecuting Colorado officials for doing what they're required to do in the state constitution, which over 55% of the people told them to do. And the president said that he had bigger fish to fry. And that's true. And so we had the statement from the administration, which was logical and a way to avoid an unfortunate conflict between the state and federal uh, authorities. We do have bigger fish to fry. The problem was that there were 83 independent U.S. attorneys who were frying those smaller fish. <laughs> so we sought and obtained clarification from the Department of Justice that they would not essentially be prosecuting people who were operating under the color of state law and set up some conditions whereby that would be respected. Well, this helps us even more because if you can have a, a, a regimen in these states where medical or recreational marijuana is legal, and you can do this to the satisfaction of the Department of Justice, it ought to be a no-brainer to set up a system whereby hemp meets that criteria and would not be prosecuted. It's, it's very, for me, uh, exciting to have that guidance from the U.S. Attorney uh, laying out the priorities, but even more important for us in Oregon, the U.S. Attorney Amanda Marshall has stated that her position will be to rely on state and local authorities to address localized activities. And in a recent letter, we've made copies, I think, uh, from U.S. Attorney Marshall, the department expects that states which legalize cultivation or use of cannabis, whether for industrial purposes, medical purposes, or otherwise, will establish and enforce strict regulatory schemes that protect the eight federal interests that are identified. They will take a trust but verify approach. And as long as the state follows through in imposing those controls, it's not likely that they will be um, uh, there will be any uh, threatened uh, federal act, and federal action will be less necessary. Look at the actual language. But the point is. If that's the case for marijuana, it certainly informs the guidance for him. So it ought to be easier, more direct, and virtually no reason that there would be any involvement. And it's important for us to give clarification to the men and women who may decide to be involved uh, that they're not going to be interfered with. Um, and I hope that it gives the assurance to the state. The state has been extraordinarily, uh, uh, I think, uh, forthcoming on this with the Department of Agriculture and the state legislature. Uh, so we're, I think, well positioned. We'll actually have an opportunity to hear from a representative from the State Department of Agriculture today. Now, you may have noticed 
the last few months have not necessarily been the shining moments for the United States Congress. <laughs> there, there have been some controversies and some dysfunction. But for me, one of the highlights in a really miserable period was watching in this Congress moments of bipartisanship around the hemp issue. During the Farm Bill debate, uh, together with a colleague from Colorado, Jared Polis, and one from Kentucky, Thomas Massey, a Republican from Kentucky, who has agreed to be our lead with the legislation in Congress, we offered what we thought was sort of a simple common sense amendment. That's always a danger sign in Congress because those are the first to lose. Um, that would allow colleges and universities to grow and cultivate hemp for academic and agricultural research purposes. Yes. It passed with bipartisan support. I think it was 225 votes. And that provision is still on the table for the farm bill discussion we have now. And we're working for the conference committee. And it's, I mean, it's, it, the, the, some of the stuff that's going to be in the bill makes me cringe. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to vote for it. But I think we're going to be able to keep this provision and be able to do something else that's very important. It's not just to give a clear signal to Oregon agriculture that it is appropriate for them to go forward if they cultivate it as they see fit. It's important to help them cultivate it. And for us to be able to do the research that OSU is capable of it, and they do amazing things there to help other Oregon industries, from the cheese makers, uh, people who brew beer, wine, small fruits and vegetables, um, their forestry. I mean, they, they are not just American experts, they're global experts at OSU. Tremendously powerful research capacity. And now they might be able to do research on him in terms of how to grow it in product applications uh, that is a part of establishing a new element for Oregon industry. Um, we have, we're about to hear from an all-star panel. I think I've stalled long enough. I think we've got everybody here who's going to be here. Although, thank you, Cable Access, um, uh, for being here. Uh, when you're, when you're uh, uh, on your exercise machine at 2 in the morning and just don't quite know what to do and you're tired of watching speeches uh, on the floor of the house on C-SPAN reruns, uh, you'll be able to watch this and listen from our uh, experts. Um, I, want, I did want to acknowledge um, how helpful uh, the Department of Agriculture um, Katie Koba has been. She's the director uh, uh, in talking through with her the nature of this federal uh, partnership. Uh, Whole Foods, a leader in adapting uh, alternative products to retail markets and helping them become more mainstream. Uh, thank you. Uh, hearing from Rick Rutherford, an Oregon farmer I just met for the first time from Dufer, who's interested in doing a deep dive in cultivating hemp. Well, I think the stakes are high for Oregon. We want to be able to strengthen our economy, particularly what happens in rural and um, small town Oregon. Being able to have one more product that they can cultivate um, that uh, has a number of applications, I think is a step towards helping the economy uh, in an area that's been battered by the recession. And as we research, grow, and be able to ex uh, have access to him, I think it's also going to help small entrepreneurs, I mean, people who have ideas for hemp products that can be more affordable and accessible. Uh, so I think it's going to unleash other areas of economic activity. So why don't we just invite our uh, panelists to come forward? 
take a seat. Uh, we might just ask each of you to just make a couple of brief words of self-introduction and then kind of launch in. We're going to ask them each to uh, speak, you know, five minutes or so to sort of lay out uh, your perspective. Uh, but we want to have time at the end for you to ask the experts uh, questions um, because this is a part of an effort that we need to do here. We want to uh, support and encourage uh, this process being set up uh, with the uh, with the state of Oregon, the Department of Agriculture. Um, we want to learn from one another, and we want to inform the public so we can lay the foundation. I would like Oregon to be a leader as we move to the point where it is clearly going to be authorized under federal statute, and we are doing more for research and product development. But Oregon, once again, is poised to be a real leader, and we can't thank you enough for being here today to be part of the conversation, and I'm, if, you, if you wait 30 seconds for me to get situated so I can start taking notes, I would appreciate it. Welcome. Sounds good. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for coming out today. I'm Eric Steenstra. I'm with the Hemp Industries Association, and I'm also on the board of Votem. I'm Lindsay Ang. I'm with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Uh, Rick Rutherford, a uh, farm wheat in eastern Oregon in a town called Dufer, and a uh, fourth generation farmer, native there. My name is Errol Schweitzer, Global Grocery Coordinator for Whole Foods Market. Been in the national organic food industry for about 18 years. My name is Russ Caro. I'm head of the Department of Crop and Soil Science at Oregon State University. Um, yeah, I want to want to thank you, uh, Representative Blumenauer, for hosting this uh, event today and for inviting us all out and uh, for your leadership, really, in Congress. Um, you know, I I've been working on working with in industrial hemp for over 20 years and specifically on the political side of it for about uh, the last 13 with vote hemp and i gotta tell you it was, it's been a long hard slog when we started this we thought oh yeah you'll probably have this legalized in five years or something and uh here we are 13 years later and we're still uh you know pushing hard so uh it's really nice to sort of see how things are things are changing and we're starting to get into the mainstream and out of the uh yeah, in the very beginning, Ron Paul was our, our first uh, uh, co-sponsor of a hemp, hemp legislation, interestingly, and he was he did it at the request of Ralph Nader, believe it or not. And, and uh, anyways, uh, nobody really wanted to work with Ron Paul back in 2005. I think he may have been one of our first 10 or 15 co-sponsors back in the day. But in any case, I also want to thank the entire Oregon delegation because really you, you guys are very fortunate here. You have a... Uh, you know, a lot of leadership here. Senator Wyden has, has led in the Senate. Uh, everyone in the delegation is, uh, uh, with the uh, exception of Representative Walden, is a co-sponsor, and Representative Walden did vote for the, uh, the uh, farming amendment that was on, on the farm bill. So Oregon has been a real, you know, leader state on this issue. Um, I also wanted to mention, just recognize Senator Brzezanski, the state senator here, who led here in the state legislature and got uh, have passed. You know, he put the bill up a number of times. I think at the request of Carol Moran and maybe Jerry uh, Shapiro down in Eugene. And uh, at first, it took you know two or three sessions, never got through. But in any case, he finally uh, he finally pulled it off. And so that's part of the reason we're here today as well. With Oregon being one of the ten states that actually has it authorized under state law. And then, as uh, Representative Blumenauer mentioned, this this memo. This is really fantastic because we've been working for years to get the Justice Department. To, to take a look at this, you know, other states have tried to approach them about this, and uh, this is the first U.S. attorney to make a public statement on this, and this is huge. Um, so, I mean, we're very excited about this, and this kind of opens the door for the Department of Agriculture and other officials here in the state to say, okay, now we've got a clear guideline for how this can work and how what we have to do in order to make it possible for farmers to grow hemp. Um, I will just uh, reiterate a couple of things. Uh, uh, the, the Farm Bill Amendment that passed was by, not only bipartisan, but we had 63 Republicans and 162 yeah. Democrats. I don't think you can find too many bills that are passing the House right now with that kind of a bipartisan uh, support. It was incredible, and we were just you know, really thankful for the group that, that brought that forward. And um, 
but I do want to emphasize that uh, this is only a first step. This research amendment is only going to, it's going to, it's going to crack the door open, but we have got to get, we've got uh, a bill in the House, H.R. 525, as bill in the Senate, S359, and we have got to get those bills passed and get this put permanently into law so that hemp is no longer confused with marijuana and farmers have a clear path to grow it. Because even with this research <laughs> memo and this memo, we're still in a, you know, quasi, you know, legal situation and it's gonna still make it difficult for, for farmers to go forward. So um, just a couple other things real quick I'll mention. Uh, the Hemp Industries Association is holding a conference in Washington DC next weekend, the 17th and 18th. Uh, and uh, if anybody's interested, you can go to the HIA.org. We'll have a lot of speakers there from different areas talking about industrial hemp. We're also doing a lobby day on the 18th where we'll be going to the Hill, meeting with our representatives and you know really pushing for the legislation. And then uh, finally, I wanted to mention Hemp History Week, which is an initiative that uh, HIA has, has been doing now. This will be our fifth year. And Hemp History Week for 2014 will be uh, the 2nd through the 9th of June. And it's at hemphistoryweek.com. If you always want to get involved, we have opportunities to do local events, get involved. A lot of the stores are involved. Whole Foods has been a great supporter of this. And so, anyway, with that, I'll pass it along to uh, Thank you. Um, well, I, I feel like. Um Congressman Blumenauer kept saying uh, experts on the panel, and um, I certainly don't feel that I should be um, put in that category. Um, but we are uh, navigating the waters at the Department of Agriculture and looking at developing rules. And so we're very interested in learning from those that um, have experience in, the, in industrial hemp and um, how we can make the rules here in the state um, common sense and work for farmers and handlers. So I'll just give a little overview of um, the history, kind of where we are in Oregon. Um, Senator Prusanski's bill, as Eric mentioned, um, passed the Oregon legislature in 2009. Um, and I think we've talked about it, and most of you in the room are familiar. Um, the Department of Agriculture did not move forward at that time in promulgating rules because of the quasi-legal status. Um, there was some concern that given the Controlled Substances Act and the need for a DEA permit um, and the illegality in most cases for you to grow hemp, we didn't want to be licensing um, farmers to be able to grow it if it was putting them in, in jeopardy under federal law as well as us as the state agency. Um, so when the Washington and Colorado um, electorates um, passed their legislation last year, we put together an internal team to start looking at if we had um, medical marijuana, we have medical marijuana in Oregon, if we had med marijuana for personal use that would be legalized in Oregon, would that change what we could do? And then we saw the August 29th Department of Justice memo that uh, Congressman um, mentioned that had what, how states can move forward and the eight kind of principles for a robust uh, enforcement system that the Department of Justice would be in expecting. And so we've looked at that and we've um, been looking at moving forward. And so we, where we are now is we've kind of developed a rules advisory committee. Um, like I said, we, um, well in any legislation that we do, or not legislation, sorry, in any rulemaking that we do, um, we always want to make sure that it's going to be applicable and common sense for the actual producers and handlers. So the, the Oregon law focuses on licensing and permitting of growers and handlers. Um, I brought a copy of it, but I don't know if most of you have probably seen it. Um, and I can certainly provide, I can certainly provide copies um, if you guys need it. Um, but the essential uh, elements of the way the Oregon statute reads is, is that it asks the Department of Agriculture to license on a three-year basis um, growers and handlers um, of industrial hemp. And so what that means is obviously growers, I think, is a self-explanatory um, piece, but handlers would be um, the first handler, the person who would be receiving the raw agricultural product and processing it. Um, as the congressman mentioned, processed hemp products are legal for interstate commerce. 
um, and there's not an issue there, but it's the uh, seed uh, going to a processor who can process it for oil that would have to be licensed. Um, and then there's also a permitting process, also a three-year permit that would um, allow seed dealers so that we could have seed be a uh, viable seed be able to be grow, uh, sold for growing it. Um, currently under Controlled Substances Act, only sterilized seed so that you couldn't grow um, is allowed to be sold. So that's what the Oregon law focuses on. Um, it also, um, the congressman mentioned the definition of industrial hemp, which is actually in our state statute at the 0.3% of THC. And so um, there would have to be inspections uh, where we would take samples of the crop um, and test those for THC comment, or content, sorry, um, and to, to ensure that it was below the 0.3%. Um, so that's what we're dealing with, um, and we'll be promulgating rules around that. Um, the rules will kind of focus on application for licenses, what we need um, to get for, in order to issue those licenses and permits, the inspection procedures, sampling procedures, how often, at what time uh, in the growing process would we need to do that. Um, obviously fees, um, it would have to be a fee-supported program, so we'll have to um, look at the, the fiscal impact to the department as well as the users. Um, and then also things like tolerances. So if 0.3% is the definition in our statute, what is the tolerance as we test? Um, and how you know how close can we test it? What um, you know part per million um, level are we going down to, and what we need to go down to? So those kinds of things are what we'll be working on with our rules advisory committee. Um, we have started to contact people for the rules advisory committee. The under Oregon State Administrative Procedures Law that directs us on how we develop administrative rules. Rules advisory committees are generally mostly for fiscal impact. Um, that's what they're supposed to be used for, but we will obviously be using our committee and leaning on them heavily um, to help in the practical application um, and the agronomic application. And so we've um, tried to get a couple of growers, a couple of handlers, the Farm Bureau, we have a representative from Oregon Prozan, uh, Oregon Senator Krasansky's office, and OSU, we got Russ to be on the panel, um, so that we can uh, have those experts weigh in. Um, and then as, as we meet with that committee, and we're hoping to do that in early December, um, then the rules process is such that we would have an open comment period um, and a hearing, potentially multiple hearings, if feel the need to, but we put out the draft rules and then have an open comment period where we would take comments, um, review those comments, and see if any changes need to be made before the rule went into effect. So um, we have said, um, I think there was an Oregonian article this um, this week um, that we're trying to, we would like to have the rule in place by the spring planning season. That's a very aggressive timeline, and we'll be working on that. So <laughs> um, that's why we're getting started in early December. So um, we should hopefully, we hope to have um, rules out for comment um, by their definitely first quarter of next year. I think that's mostly what I have. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. This is probably our most important thing. Uh, as part of our Rules Advisory Committee, um, one of the things that we are looking for, so if anyone in this room knows of someone or is somebody who um, is a fiber handler, a first handler of fiber, um, we have a couple of representatives on our committee that are can do the oil squeezing and um, handling of the seed, but um, we don't have anyone at this point that can process the fiber. We'd certainly like to hear that point of view because there's a lot of fiber, as you know, um, that'll be produced. So I will. Uh, great. I will talk to you hopefully um, after after the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful.
Uh, I would like to offer my thanks to Congressman Blumenauer and his staff for having me on this forum and for having this actual forum. And for all of you folks who come down here and check it out, because the more information we get out about hemp and what a fabulous planet it is and what it could do for the economy of Oregon, one, and for the economy of the United States is uh, just tantamount. It's very important. Um, I, I'm not necessarily an expert by any means, but I have educated myself on hemp. Um, because as a wheat farmer, what we traditionally do is we grow one field one year with wheat. When it's harvested, you leave the stubble on the ground and then that field stays fallow for an entire year so that the plant breaks down and puts nutrients in the soil and you also get some moisture from the rain and so forth that gets stored in the ground. And that's what the uh, wheat seeds use to grow up again. Um, we found out that hemp is a fabulous rotational cash crop that you can be growing in this field one year and you have wheat in the other and then you swap them back and forth. Um, it works very well as a natural herbicide because it grows a lot faster than the weeds do and um, it crowds them out essentially. So you wouldn't have to use quite as much um, herbicide uh, as you would with the traditional wheat that we do right now. And I would rather not have to do it. But um, there's a lot of weeds and stuff that are very aggressive. There's thistle and like uh, morning glory and things that just will take over a field really quickly and you lose your yield. Um, we had our first hemp harvest in the United States in over 50 years in Colorado. That was awesome. And I hope to be able to do that myself. Be very soon. Um, and I have to ask the question of, well, why can't I myself grow hemp? Uh, and that question is that some years ago, um, some very moneyed interests, the Hearst family, the DuPonts, the Rockefellers got together and they came up with a thing called the Marijuana, um, what is it, the Marijuana Tax Act. Um, at the time, people referred to hemp as hemp. And so when this legislation was going through, they changed the name to marijuana so that the hemp farmers we're like, well, I don't know what this marijuana thing is. And so they didn't get involved in it until the last minute. Well, it was a little bit too late. And they were uh, pushed out to the point where they couldn't do it anymore until um, they started the hemp for victory uh, process during World War II because we needed to have ropes and canvas and a lot of things to use in the ships and to fight uh, you know, against the Axis powers. And um, one of the reasons why that is is because hemp is uh, one of the strongest plant fibers known to man, and it's very resistant to seawater. So seafaring peoples of the world have been using it in their ropes and their canvas and their sails for years and years and years because it lasts a long, long time. Um, as a matter of fact, they found uh, uh, ships at the bottom of the Mediterranean Ocean that have been down there for 2,000 years or more, and they have hemp fibers on there, and when they bring them up, they still can identify them as hemp fibers because of its fabulous resistance to seawater. And so I think that it's, it would be an amazing thing for us to be able to actually farm it here. Um, you know, that, and going back to those moneyed interests, they also came up with something called the Reefer Madness Campaign. In order to get people on board with uh, making hemp go away, they had to make people think that when people smoked it, they were gonna go crazy and jump off buildings and rape people and do all kinds of stuff. And they did a really good campaign of smearing it. Randolph Hearst was fabulous at doing that propaganda and he uh, promulgated that idea and that idea still stands today. As a matter of fact, one of Congressman Blumenauer's um, uh, cohorts that he works with is Michelle Bachman and she has an ad on her, on her webpage that is called The Faces of Pop. And what they did is they took The Faces of Meth Lady and said, she was a beauty queen, and then two weeks later, look at her after smoking pot, and she just has this melted face. And so it's just silly that a lot of people still believe in that um, stupid idea of what <laughs> hemp or, or marijuana would do to somebody if they smoked it. Um, as a matter of fact, my father used to make jokes about smoking rope, and his buddies would laugh, and I'd be like, what's smoking rope? I don't understand this. And um, I later found out it's because ropes are made from hemp, and hemp was associated with the things that are intoxicated in which it is not at all. Um, so the other thing I know about hemp is that it is one of the most easily digestible plant proteins known to man. And there are uh, no known allergens to it. So you can eat it, you can put it on your body, you can do all kinds of things with it, and it's really fabulous 
And I think that, again, we should be able to farm in the United States. I want to be able to farm as soon as possible. We're, of course, going to have to do studies because we don't know what strains are going to grow in arid areas like Eastern Oregon. Dufer doesn't get a lot of rain. So the moisture that comes out of the sky in the, in the springtime and in the wintertime, that's essentially what you get to um, irrigate your crops with. We're also in an area where you don't do a lot of irrigation from the ground unless you're growing something like alfalfa. But you can't grow alfalfa in some of the higher areas. It's usually in the lower stuff. And we have some of the best alfalfa in the world. But, you know, I'm partial to it. Um, so, um, uh, again, it comes down to educating yourselves. And that's one of the things that I did was educate myself on it as much as I could with the limited things, the limited information. More information is coming online nowadays, which is fabulous. But um, recently, a gentleman did a really simple film called Bring It Home. It's, a, uh, it's a, a, a great little documentary. It's really short, it's funny, and it's got some great information about the differences between the cannabis indica and cannabis sativa, why they're cousins, and why um, uh, we should be able, you know, be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, so if you guys could get a chance to look at that, I don't know where it's on Netflix or whatever, but uh, you, you should be able to find it someplace. But uh, it's called Bring it, Bringing It Home. Yeah, YouTube. It's, there you go. It's actually being played out there on their laptop out among the Perfect. display tables. If you want to see part of it. So I urge everybody to watch that. So uh, yeah, that's all I've got there. Um, uh, if, well, I, I, well, I do want to say one thing. If Monsanto gets a protection act, sure. yeah. why don't we have an Oregon farmer protect, protection? That's right. Uh, that's that right. Does right. <laughs> Um, it's going to be a little tech support here because I have a PowerPoint. Sorry, they gave me the option of doing a PowerPoint and said yes. <laughs> my name is Errol. I've been working for Whole Foods Market now for about 11 years. Um, my interest from hemp was sparked by the insert of a Cyclosil CD that I read while I was in college. And then uh, work that I did on mandatory minimum sentencing when I lived in New York in order to uh, stop you know, uh, criminalization. And, uh, and really realized it was all these great products that were being developed until um, I started selling them. And so a Whole Foods, the key word here is market, and we provide that market access for producers, uh, distributors, growers, uh, legal, uh, healthy, uh, and really effective industrial hemp. So what I'm here to do is help you make the most of the hemp seed and sow it everywhere, as uh, George Washington mm -hmm. said. So those are, those are two of our team members um, from our Lamar store in Austin during our last hemp promotion. So uh, just a little about Whole Foods Market, you may be familiar with us, we have a few stores here in the metro area. When we evaluate a product, we, we run it through our core values. So uh, at this point, I think we have eight, eight core values. We sell the highest quality national organic foods. Does hemp qualify? Yes. We create ongoing win-win partnerships with our suppliers. We have awesome suppliers who provide us with hemp. We support team member excellence and happiness. Hemp makes us happy. <laughs> We serve, we serve and support our local and global communities. Well, uh, looks like the state of Oregon wants us to support them. We create wealth through profits and growth. I'll go into a little bit more of that. And yes, hemp, legal hemp can be profitable. We practice and advance environmental stewardship. Hemp is a sustainable crop. It is non-genetically modified. We satisfy, delight, and nourish our customers on primitive hemp. And we promote the health of our stakeholders through healthy eating education. Yes, hemp is also healthy. I like my little Oregon hemp uh, logo there. Yeah. I did it on PowerPoint this morning. Why <laughs> hemp? Well, you, you probably all know this, preaching to the choir here. Hemp functions as a nutritional powerhouse. Uh, it's a complete protein. I've been vegan and vegetarian for parts of my life. I'm not now, but when I was, hemp was a major source of protein. It's a much better source of protein than almond or other nuts, uh, and it's a lot more digestible and healthy than soy. Um, also, it's healthy fats, complete profile fatty acids, got vitamin E for immunity, and uh, plenty of dietary fiber, which is good too. And uh, this is also one of our displays from our, our last Hemp History Week promotion, featuring products that looks like from uh, 
uh, living harvest and uh, mantle harvest. Lots of hemp leaves. So um, you've probably seen stuff like this. This is sort of the market justification. There's a lot of stuff you can do with hemp. We, you know, those tables out there from Hemp Industries Association and their allies kind of show that. Um, so you have hemp seeds, hemp stalks. Well, when um, I heard uh, Congressman Blumenauer mention uh, about a half a billion dollars, I, I think that's uh, radically underestimated just from how much I know we sell and going out to our competitors. Uh, seeing you know, two pound bags of hemp seeds at Costco now, um, going to farmers markets and seeing hemp everywhere. I, I estimate that number is a lot higher. Um, and that does not even scratch the surface of market potential when you look at all the things you can do with it. Did you know that cars currently have hemp uh, parts now, a lot of imported cars? Mm. I didn't until recently. So hemp and whole foods, we got about 90 brands that currently use hemp ingredients, mostly from uh, Canada. Um, about 300 products on, on or off. We don't really have very good data at Whole Foods, so it's our estimate, as my friend Christina would know. Uh, right now it's about 25% annual growth. Um, so that's that's a multiple of uh, three or four of our own company growth. That's one of our top growing trends right now. And um, it has been like that for the last uh, three to four years. And it's also the core ingredient in growth brands. So you got all these awesome uh, companies that are utilizing hemp. Uh, a couple more recent items, including a really great veggie burger from a, uh, Kansas called Hillary's. She's got a, a hemp burger. Um, I saw a, a hemp tofu that we're working on. Instead of soybean tofu, it's going to be a tofu. So um, we've got a lot of products that we can der be derived. Obviously, uh, soap and cleaning products is a big, big thing. Uh, Non-dairy beverages, hemp as a nut milk. Um, you know, for cereal, for baking, um, cereal snacks and bars. Nature's Path has done a fabulous job of marketing hemp in their products. Uh, vegetarian meat protein sources, so not just um, you know protein shakes uh, as an alternative to whey or soy, uh, but also, like I said, uh, meat alternatives, and, uh, you know, burgers and hot dogs and uh, tofu, etc. Uh, I've actually seen hemp yogurt. I'm not sure if we commercialized it yet. It wasn't that good, but uh, we're working on it. <laughs> Uh, essential fatty acids and culinary oils, um, and then you know stuff that aren't necessarily selling groceries, textiles and apparel. Um, and then finally, talking to our construction team about utilizing hempcrete, uh, we actually did a promotion on uh, hemp as a concrete source in Colorado this summer during our Hemp History Week. Um, and they were showing off like you know it's like cinder blocks made out of hemp. I had no idea. Um, so see, these are some of the brands that we've worked really closely with. Uh, I think we're doing Hemp History Week promotions now for about three years, and every year I think we've gotten better at it. Uh, it's a big uh, thanks to uh, Christine Mulgacy and the, the Bronner's folks, but also these other brands, Living Harvest, Manitoba Harvest, uh, Nature's Path, and Nutiva. And that is a display, um, like they say, everything's bigger in Texas. That is a uh, Texas-sized hemp display out of the Bel Air store in Houston. Uh, really great grocery team leader there, um, who really gets behind this stuff. And uh, this is a picture uh, from the USDA. I believe this is uh, in Arlington, in uh, Virginia. And those are hemp stalks. And so uh, I can't wait to go visit Rick's farm to see him standing by 15 minutes all hemp stalks next year. Rick, I'd like that exclusive on your products. We'll talk about that. So this is 2013, our Hemp History Week promo, about 880 events. Uh, this is more than even just uh, Whole Foods. Uh, up to 300% sales lift. I don't want to bore you with numbers here, but I think we do over a million in sales in like two weeks on hemp products that included hemp. And then all the other stuff that you guys heard today, about 20 states, um, 10,000 signatures. It's just, it's growing, you know, it's uh, it's going to happen. And then uh, internally, we just did a lot of PR. We, um, the last years, have had some really good uh, blogs, social media, um, in source signage, marketing demos, a lot of customer engagement. Folks really get behind it, really excited about it. You know, our team members building displays. Uh, doing demos and uh, talking to customers about all this stuff. So it leads me to uh, say to you folks, what the hemp are we waiting for? <laughs> <laughs> and um, that is a, I don't know if you call it a sprig of hemp from Colorado. I did get to attend the first ever legal domestic industrial cultivation of hemp in uh, southeastern Colorado. It was an incredible experience and that hemp did taste good. So thank you so much. Russ Carroll, I'm head of the Crop and Soil Science Department at Oregon State University. 
And what I'm going to do is spin off from the product side of this and talk a little bit about some of the production uh, realities uh, as far as we know them at this point in time uh, here in Oregon and what that may mean for hemp industry uh, in the state of Oregon. And so trying to align expectations at this point. So crops, new crops, alternate crops are nothing new to the state of Oregon. Uh, we've got, at last estimate, over 220 different crops that are being grown, crops and natural resource uh, products across the state. There's over 100 of uh, those crops, commodities that have a farm gate value of over a million dollars. So unlike other parts of the nation uh, where the growers are faced with very few cropping alternatives, we have many choices in this state. And unlike growers in some other parts of the nation, if you ask a grower here, you bring them something and say, what do you think about chicory? The questions they'll ask are, uh, where can I get the seed? What do I know? What do you, can you tell me about the production conditions? How much is it worth? And when are you going to pay me? <laughs> and from those four points, people can, if it's something that is workable, they can pretty well figure it out and see if it makes sense in our production environment. What I've done in the back, I don't know if everybody picked it up, but there's a handout that has far more technical detail than most of you are probably going to be interested in. But for those that are interested in thinking about producing hemp, I'd ask you to pick a copy of that up and uh, take a look at some of the information that's there. The short story is that hemp is a warm season crop. It would be very similar to sweet corn, soybeans, sunflower. If you think about the Willamette Valley, and everybody goes, well, we grow corn in the Willamette Valley, but it's sweet corn. It's not grain corn. There's very little grain corn grown here. Very few sunflowers, very few soybeans, and that's because of the temperature regime that we all love uh, in Western Oregon and across Oregon. We have a Mediterranean climate. Uh, rainfall comes during the winter months, and during the summer we have cool night temperatures and uh, moderate uh, heat. Uh, we rarely, of late, we've been getting up into the 90s and 100s, but generally we expect that the summer temperatures are going to be in the high 80s. Uh, something like a corn plant, uh, the optimum growing conditions for a corn plant is if the nighttime temperature drops below 50 degrees, the plant goes into physiological shock because it's not designed to grow with its physiology at temperatures that low. Uh, and the top end temperature for something like grow corn is uh, 86 degrees, so it's got a fairly narrow range. Uh, we think that hemp has a wider range than that. We've not grown hemp here, we've not grown current varieties, but we can look at the information that's available from other parts of the world. And what we find in most plant uh, biology, plant physiology, is that you don't change the plant significantly. There may be things at the edges, and that's what we're going to have to look at, at the plants that are well adapted uh, to colder night temperatures, shorter growing seasons. Uh, but at this point, looking at the information we can find from both Canada and from Europe and trying to translate that into an Oregon context, we're going to be really hard pushed uh, to grow seeded hemp here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, the maturity, the, because of the temperature regimes that we've got, you're going to be looking at maturation uh, in late September, October. And if you're trying to uh, mature a crop, dry a crop down, you know what late September and October is like. Fiber crop may be much easier. Uh, depending on the varieties, the, the maturity of the fiber occurs when the male flowers on the plant have matured. So it's much earlier in the growing season. And there you'd be looking at things in July, August, which make much more sense. Uh, so we may be able to easily grow fiber crops, the seeded crops, getting both seed and fiber may be more difficult. And then the other thing we have to think about is we enjoy our dry summers, but if you're trying to grow a crop uh, during the summer, 
and actively grow that crop as industrial hemp would be growing, you're going to need water. Um, and if you think about the corn, the green beans, uh, the other crops that are out in the valley in the summer months, they're being irrigated. And so you're going to have to figure out if you're going to grow the crop on large scale, where are you going to get the water from? And then the question that other large commercial, the current large commercial growers are going to ask is, what's it worth? When are you going to pay me? And they're going to look at the production economics of that. Do I put my water on green beans? Do I put my water on sweet corn, which are very high value crops versus something like hemp? So there are, you know, we need to think about some of those possibilities. Now, there are other parts of the state we very successfully grow corn in Hermiston, Ontario. If you're further inland, they still have a Mediterranean climate, but those are heat pockets, as is uh, southwestern Oregon. So we very successfully grow corn in the Hermiston area. They set national yield records uh, for 300, 325 bushel corn. So you could grow hemp in that environment very easily. But you're up against 300 bushel corn at $5 a, a bushel at this point. You're up against potatoes, carrots, green beans. So again, the growers there are going to look at what does this crop bring me versus the value that I'm going to get out of it. In Rick's area, uh, we have grown dryland corn in parts of the Columbia Basin. Uh, there's a st experiment station called the Morrow Experiment Station, and they've grown dryland corn uh, for the last four or five years. And they're getting about uh, 35, 40 bushel corn. You may have seen some of that that Brian Tuck had out. But again, if you're getting 300 bushels in the irrigated area, and you're getting 35, 40 bushels in the dryland area, you know, again, align expectations for what you're looking at as far as uh, yields in those possible situations. So I guess as I think about this, we can do anything on small scales. If somebody is interested in growing a crop in this state, we've got a pliable enough environment that you're going to be able to grow what you want. You're going to have to figure out where you get the water from. You're going to have to figure out how you can plant it early and what you can do as far as protecting uh, the seed so that you can get it planted and capture early season uh, growing heat units. Uh, there are ways you can uh, look at it. But don't assume that you're going to be able to uh, immediately, once we've got it legal to grow, that it's immediately going to move out into large scale production. So think about those things, align expectations appropriately, and we'll be in good shape. And now, they're all yours. <laughs> Just identify yourself and make your comment or question. My name is Tony Stacy. Rick, we have two things in common. I am also a Navy we veteran. Can give you a microphone? So no, and a farmer. <laughs> and uh, my question for you is, uh, at, what issues do you see will be happening as you try to get the product into manufacturing? Well, currently there aren't any processing facilities, uh, to say the least, or really storage facilities. Um, you, we're to grow the crop. I mean, if you put the cart before the horse, we have to, in the market there, the problem is going to be, um, it hasn't been grown in the United States uh, in over 50 years until just recently. Um, who are the people that are going to be that are going to build the facilities? Uh, are they going to want to invest the money to have a redding facility? Um, and redding is when you break the stocks down to um, get the, the hull out the inside of it and then use the fibers uh, depending on what it's going to be used for. Um, so. Hopefully there'll be people out there that will see the future in it and they will want to invest in it or maybe the money will come from the federal government so that we can get this going and make an alternative type thing to help the economy. That's, I think, going to be the issue, the biggest issue. Um, first, we have to learn which strains are going to grow best in what regions. Uh, as 
uh, Russ said, oh, hemp, you know, hemp grows all around the world, so uh, we'll have to find the strain or variety that works the best in our climb. Hopefully it'll work. I don't know if it will work. Uh, it possibly won't. Well, we'll move, move on to something else, but I'll do my best to further it around the country so that other people where it can be grown can use it. So it's just that infrastructure thing has to be put in place, and that's going to be, I think, the biggest hurdle. I guess. And one other thing on that, too, I think that uh, the other the other side of the farming side as well, you know, the companies that produce equipment for farming here in the U.S. haven't had any new hand for hemp. And so a combine for hemp is going to be a little different. They might have to make some adjustments. There's going to be some need to invest both on the, you know, on the harvesting and processing side. And I know that in Canada, for example, they've been working on getting fiber processing up and online. It's a lot more expensive to, to set up a full fiber processing line. And there's several companies that are looking at creating bio refineries, but it's taken a lot longer. So the seed side is probably where the market could move a little more quickly. It's less, it's easier to harvest the seed and it's easier to process it. So fiber may just take a little bit more, but it is going to take some people's vision and some money to come in and make all that happen. No, on a second note, though, um, I did speak to a gentleman who farms hemp in Manitoba a few years back at the Hemp History Week celebration, and I asked him what they use to uh, harvest their with their hemp with, and he said, we use a wheat combine. And I was like, oh, that's amazing, because we grow with it, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you. Hi, my name's Chuck, and I don't, my question is about what defines uh, hemp from marijuana, and the problem that Oregon might have to have such a narrow, limited definition of hemp as being a 0.3% of THC, and, uh, Literature indicates that medical marijuana is defined as 17% THC. 0.3 is so narrow. Is uh, the market potentially crippled? And are farmers practically limited by having such a narrow definition of hemp? And ought hemp to be defined as 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% THC? And so the federales don't hammer anybody for having. Uh, so that the farmer can, in fact, explore a range of seed type. Because apparently, if you just say 0.3, then your market's limited to whoever's generating that, which could end up being Monsanto with their uh, now copyrighted uh, type of seed. And it, aren't we in a pickle, really, to limit to 0.3? And isn't there, uh, don't, doesn't the Department of Ag need to be pushing the feds to kind of mellow out and, and allow a broader definition. So um, the 0.3% of THC definition is actually not in federal law. The, uh, in federal More. law, um, they don't define industrial hemp from cannabis, as we've talked about. Um, however, it is in our state statute. So as the Department of Ag, it would have to be a legislative action, um, not an agency action. Um, I believe that the 0.3%, um, and you guys can probably talk about this um, more uh, better than I can, but I believe that that's um, kind of an industry standard for industrial hemp because it cannot be construed as having any um, value of the THC to, to use for drug purposes or use as a drug. So that's so my, where I think it's just My question is essentially then a political one, isn't it? Well, yeah, so just, just a little quick history. The, the standard was developed in Europe and then in Canada, and so it's sort of been a de facto international standard. We didn't come up with that as, like, you know, unique. We kind of said, okay, this is what's working. And, and the Canadians and the Europeans have been able to develop a hemp industry around that standard. Now, does it limit you somewhat? Uh, yeah, it might. You know, I mean, is, is there a variety of hemp that, you know, has half a percent THC? That might be better. Yeah, it might be, and that might be something we need to take a look at down the line. Will we ever see a situation where farmers are growing hemp at uh, five or ten percent THC? I seriously doubt it because you're talking about psychoactive varieties that somebody could pull out of the field and, and uh, you know and smoke. So I think that you have to make a distinction there between generally the internationally it's 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 recognized as above one percent. You get into varieties that then have psychoactive potential when you're talking about the THC. So. But, um, I, you know, I wouldn't disagree with you that it might be nice to have a little bit higher or have flexibility to be able to say, hey, maybe you know, a little higher than three tenths, but it is kind of what, what it is. Yeah. There's a number of crops that have other um, 
levels, so something like canola has to be below 2% uh, uricic acid, so it's, it's not versus industrial um, rapeseeds. So it's not uncommon to have these kind of biological limits, and there are seed certification systems both in Europe, Canada, here in the U.S., that once you've got varieties uh, that are known to have these low levels, to maintain those is not a problem. You can do crossbreeding among the varieties that are low uh, in the THC levels, and you should be able, you know, there may be the occasional uh, variety that would be useful or may have some useful characteristic through traditional plant breeding you can oftentimes take something like that breed it into your low uh, lines and breed something that has the new characteristic using standard breeding techniques. Uh, my name is Paul Milius, I'm a guest interested citizen and uh, in the medical marijuana program. Um, you would expect significant opposition to this change from the paper and uh, timber industries. They've long been uh, supporters of, uh, of the war on drugs because, you know, hemp is a competitive product for them. Um, that's one question. Second question is, uh, when I lived in Northern Illinois before I moved here, there were still acreage, and some of them state park, uh, where, of hemp fields that was left over from World War II. Do we not have any research data on growing hemp from those years that uh, might help us uh, as we look at this uh, new era of gloriousness? Yeah. We, to answer your second question first, the, we do actually, the, the picture that Errol showed of the 15-foot tall, tall hemp plants in Arlington, that was actually a USDA researcher named Leister Dewey who grew hemp in Arlington Farms, which is now where the Pentagon is located in Arlington, Virginia, and uh, he's he we've actually got his diaries. Uh, you know, he has published a lot of research on it. So we have a lot of historical stuff, and I noticed that uh, Rick has a great book here too by Chris Conrad called "Hemp Life: Life of the Future." There's some other books out there. It's not you know super technical on the growing side, but there is a lot of historical information out there uh, on, on hemp farming. And uh, there are bulletins. There were. The USDA and others, other states did research bulletins back in the 40s, uh, so that kind of information is available. Uh, unfortunately, there was a USDA Ag Research Service breeding program in Wisconsin, it had been here in Oregon, uh, down in Corvallis in Albany, and they pulled it out in the late 1930s and moved it to Wisconsin because conditions were better there. Uh, unfortunately, as we went through this whole craze in the 40s and 50s, they dumped all the germplasm. So historically, where material was put into a national germplasm repository, there's none of that uh, present these days. But there are international seed sources. How about the uh, political opposition from the paper and uh, timber industry? Well, that's always been there. <laughs> I mean. I've never seen any sign of it. There's not any lobbyists for those industries that I'm aware of up on, uh, you know, coming up to Capitol Hill saying we got to stop this hemp thing. I don't know if uh, Representative Blumenauer has ever heard from anybody other than the DEA who's opposed to this. So that's as far as I know, and it's not significant. And there's no significant opposition there. There's a fair bit of research going on looking at the hemp fiber as an additive to wood products. So I think from a use materials use standpoint, fiber boards and other things, there would actually be interest from the wood industry in cooperative efforts because of the unique characteristics of hemp fiber. My name is Michelle Sapien. Um, I have three questions. I don't know how uh, you'll answer them, but if you've already, I, I don't think you've already answered them exactly. Uh, first one is, what is the process of sterilizing hemp seeds. My understanding is sterilization requires irradiation. Would that be uh, a necessity in order to make sure that the seeds could be grown and, and yet not be used for uh, medical, uh, uh, recreational purposes? That, that's a good question. So there's two ways I know that you can sterilize hemp seeds. There may be more, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be irradiation. It can also be like a steam process where it basically would kill the viability of the seed. But I think what uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Oregon Department of Agriculture is talking about it. They would authorize processors 
who could take live seed and press it and create, so you wouldn't have to sterilize it because sterilizing would be like not beneficial for the for the seed. You know, the oil would not be you know, it would be in better shape if it was not heated up or or you know damaged that way. Well, and um, hemp seed is uh, one of the primary seeds in bird feed. Uh, you see it all over the place. People don't even know that, but it's sterilized seed that's brought into the country. It's the only way you can bring it in. If it's sterilized, it won't grow. And if you look at, if you take a handful of all, most of those seeds in there are hemp. <laughs> it's been the best fish food 3,000 years. Yes, sir. My next question is, uh, does the percentage of the THC in hemp affect its various uses? Uh, it, it is three per, is 0.03%, I believe it was. Uh, the highest level and the best usage level of hemp for industrial purposes, or is somewhere above or below that? There's, there, you know, there's no real research that anybody's done that I know of, or you know, it's published research that says, okay, we tried to grow varieties that were, you know, two tenths, you know, four tenths, six tenths, eight tenths, and we wanted to see what the results were. So it's a real, I mean, you know, there's some people that have said that they think maybe the higher THC varieties might you know, have some advantages. I, I don't know, we, you know, it's something that needs to be, you know, could be looked into, but there's no evidence that we can't produce good quality hemp seed, good quality fiber from the varieties that are within the, the limits that are, you know, that they're, they're having no problem with that in Canada and the other places where they're doing it. And my last question. Um, and probably uh, Mr. Caro would, would be more able to answer this. Uh, it's, uh, my question is, wouldn't variety of uses of hemp increase each bushel value? And do you know how profitable uh, Colorado's hemp crop, hemp crop has been? So the things, varieties oftentimes will differ in protein. We've not looked at any of that kind of detail, but there certainly will be some differences in protein content, protein composition, oil content among different varieties. So from a seed standpoint, uh, depending on how you're going to use the variety, there would be differences in, in value potentially, but I don't know what that range is at this point in time. And I don't have any information on that. I don't know if anybody has a Colorado see what the yields were there. Yeah, uh, my name is Tim Bates, and uh, I held up a hemp board earlier when I, I waved this around. It was one I made with uh, CNS Specialty Builder Supply 20 years ago with Bill Conn and David C. Rose on the, the board of directors of that. And I've been uh, working with the Colorado group all year. Uh, and what we did was we, we covered as much seed as possible, and we're going to use that for the 20,000 acres that we have uh, uh, promised to us this next year. Uh, we just finished with the first 200 acres. Uh, wow. With the uh, the biomass that we came off, that they came off, that some of it's still in the field, and so it, it may or may not be recoverable. But we will be using that for research and for the, the production of hempcrete is what we're expecting for the rest of that. Uh, we are working with uh, some other individuals. We really don't have anything we can announce currently. But we made, you know, within 48 hours about some some plants. Uh, so things are moving along. I appreciate all the free advertising you get in our organization all day. Uh, and, and quite frankly, we are very, very interested in every in all of these you were saying. I live here in Portland, and uh, I've been involved in Oregon for a long time. But we weren't growing hemp here, so I had to go somewhere else. So forgive me, but I'd rather do it here. And I'd rather do it in Washington. And so one of my questions is is an obvious one, especially with a, a, a federal official here is that if I do grow it in Washington and I want to transport it to a hemp plant in Oregon because I don't want to build two plants right across the river from each other, would that be to make me a, you know, a transporter of Schedule One drug material and you know, subject to federal prosecution? I think that's going to be an important question for people who will be you know, handling this stuff, as I intend to do, as much as I can get. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can speak um, about interstate um, commerce because that's obviously um, governed by the federal government, and we can't, we don't, that won't be part of our rules. But this is certainly something that we're looking at um, as we talked about 
fiber, um, also um, something we'll have to discuss in rules as we look at how this might work in Oregon is seed as well, um, bringing, bringing in the seed to grow it. Um, and I think so that's certainly a question that, that will have to be discussed more often, but I can't yeah, speak research. to whether that would be. Yeah, for research uh, uh, purposes, we'd like to transport some of that crop from uh, from Colorado to uh, Washington State University. This was actually made in the Wood Products uh, Composite Laboratory there. So I've been work on working back and forth with them throughout the year. Uh, I'd love to do it if I continue research and ask some questions for OSU. And you know, because there's some, you answered a lot actually a few can minutes you, ago. But, can you process it down to just stock? Uh, it, it just depends on what type of uh, processes you're, you're talking about. Uh, you know, there are multiple things here, and I, I really am not really able to disclose well, I'm them. just, uh, I guess what I'm getting at is that okay. once you, once you, if you just get stock, it's a legal product, and you can transport it without any problem. Thank uh, you. That's, that's the simple answer. Good. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say when we were talking about seed, and, and Eric alluded to this, that the Controlled Substances Act does define specifically what are, um, Processed products, I believe, and the the full mature stocks after they've been harvested are are legal for interstate movement because it's a legal product. And the same with the that's where the kind of sterilized seed comes into play because it's considered a processed product. So it would be different from what we're looking at in Oregon in terms of uh, permitting viable seed. So, My name is Michael West. I'm a biochemist up here in the Northwest, based out of Seattle, and I'm also helping develop the Colorado industry with Team Half Out of Colorado. Um, some notes, I know that the Colorado State Hemp Law allows the importation of live cannabis and hemp seeds protected under NAFTA, it's written into their constitution. There's no reason why we should not be able to import live hemp varieties. I know that Colorado is planning on planting 25 varieties next year. This, uh, to answer the question about how Colorado did, they planted three varieties. Um, spread out over the 50 published acres, more acreage. Um, it was a test crop, it did not perform well, A, because they did not have a monoculture, B, because they did not know how to grow it, and C, because it was not grown properly. Uh, next year, we will be, they will be planning profit uh, and planning on planting it. They've already been guaranteed by people to be building processing plants all the way through from people who are already built processing plants around the world. Um, is it profitable? Well, this year's hemp in Colorado was not very profitable. What was grown, we cannot give away enough. There are research universities from multiple continents asking for the hemp that we grew. Um, in 1937, 1937, it was valued at a billion dollar crop. I believe due to inflation that puts us at about $16 billion. And that's with the value at $1 to $5 a kilogram. Um, I'm a biochemist. My primary interest is building aerospace parts out of hemp. I'm pretty sure those sell for a little bit more than a dollar a kilogram on the order of thousands of times more. So is it profitable? <laughs> Grow as much as you can, please. <laughs> Grow it well. Yeah, we'll take it all. If anyone wants to grow, let us know. I got a question for you on that. Uh, about the, you were saying something about the Constitution, saying you're not important. I don't believe there's anything in the in the Constitution. The Constitutional part just defines industrial hemp, and then it directs the legislature to make regulations. I just wanted. To, is there yeah. something I've missed? Or? It is um, in the hemp bill. This year, basically, they they tried to limit limit uh, importing from Canada. Mm -hmm. Not not legally important though. Yeah, and that's and that's that should be defined at how it right. makes sense. But this year's crop will be from American seed that we're planting next year. And and the seed that we have in Colorado can plant twenty thousand acres. Hi, my name is Kevin Stewart and I noticed a couple of weeks ago a story came across the wire about how uh, redwood trees are, are 
actually really good at sequestering uh, carbon, and but they don't grow in a very large uh, habitat where it's hemp grown all over the world. And I was wondering, uh, number one, I haven't noticed any of uh, the stuff you had up here today uh, addressing hemp for fuel. And uh, the other thing is, I uh, had with this uh, uh, ship being at the bottom of the ocean for 2,000 years, and the hemp is so viable in its form, uh, has any thought been given through your organization as the hemp uh, as a viable form of uh, sequestering carbon? Yeah, so um, the carbon sequestration is definitely, uh, you know, uh, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a fact. And the, the building with uh, hemp herd, where they're basically locking it into, you know, mixing it with lime, and then, and then that actually sequesters carbon. And the uh, research they did over in the UK on that shows that there's actually more carbon captured in the construction process than what's normally released. So it's a carbon negative construction process. So that's pretty incredible. And actually, I think that's, going to be a huge market for hemp once we get it grown here. It doesn't make any sense to import it. The herd is so light and bulky, it's just trying to import that from overseas or whatever, it makes no sense. But once you're growing it here, you can build homes, you know, and uh, right here, and there's extremely good thermal properties. There's another uh, other benefits, it's uh, because it's using lime with the mold, you know, having problems with mold, I don't know if that's a big issue here in Oregon, but I think with your wetter climate, that it, it might be a big significant thing. So. Um, so there's some real advantages there, and, and as far as the fuel goes, I just think that uh, the, the, the jury's still out. I mean, there's two ways you can get fuel from hemp that I know of anyways, but right, maybe there's more. So I'm not an expert, I don't claim to be an expert on fuel, but I know the hemp seed, I think, is too high value to be realistic as a you know, mainstream fuel source. And maybe somebody's going to do it on their farm or something, but then the, the biomass conversion, you know, there's been research, some research on that, but that still isn't fully commercialized, except like with maybe sugar cane in uh, Brazil or something. So they haven't gotten there yet, but there's, there's definitely potential. I have a couple of questions. My understanding is from Washington State, and I've been researching industrial hemp and doing a pilot crop this spring. And some of the questions that I have are how is Oregon State going to? Um, with industrial hemp, we have two different tiers. There's consumption, and then there's industrial. So if you're going to be using industrial hemp for the purpose of putting it in your body or on your body, you're going to need to get, it, need to get a permit from the FDA because it's something that's federally regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. If you're going to be doing industrial hemp for the vast fibers, for any kind of textiles or building industry, then it's strictly industrial. So then it's just an agricultural aspect. So in Oregon, are you guys pursuing both sides with FDA for consumption, or are you just pursuing industrial hemp for industrial purposes? My second question is, in Washington State, under House Bill 188, we have a director who will be appointed to manage seeds. Is Oregon planning on doing the same sort of thing for procuring seeds that are viable for industrial hemp production? And also, in Washington, since we have legalized marijuana recreationally, one of my concerns is having <coughs> recreational marijuana next to a hemp field. I am in the process of working with our local farmers to do crop rotation for hemp, and I do not want to have their crop put in jeopardy with somebody who might be a thousand feet down the road growing medical marijuana in their garden. So is there, is, are these things being addressed in Oregon as well as far as zoning for the industrial purposes as opposed to somebody who might have a medicinal license to grow their own so <coughs> the crops aren't being cross-contaminated? Um, so I don't think that I can answer the first <coughs> question, but I'll start with the second question, which is the seed. Um, so seed is a part of the statute in Oregon. Um, and it directs the Department of Agriculture to write rules about the handling of seed, as well as the growing um, and selling of seed. So we have um, regulations already in Oregon, actually, for seed dealers, any, any agricultural or um, vegetable seed producer or dealer has to be licensed by the State Department of Agriculture, and that will fall under um, a similar licensing process. Um, so that will be something that will come out in the rules as we develop them. Um, it, the second, the third question, I'm sorry, was um, about potential cross-contamination. Um, and 
we have uh, OSU sitting on our panel and we'll hope that they can give us um, some guidance there. Um, because the statute sets the limit at 0.3%, that's one of the things that I mentioned we'll have to talk about. Um, what are the tolerances and, and how we will determine that. And we don't know, I don't think, um, I've seen some research or heard that um, the cross-contamination, um, having two fields next to each other could actually damage potentially both, not only um, you know the THC level that you might be shooting for for medical purposes, but also um, keeping the other one under 0.3, but I'm not a researcher and don't know that. Um, so it will certainly be something that we'll have to look into. Um, I don't, right now, the statute doesn't direct us to um, have control areas. Um, we'll have to work through that. That um, gets into quite a bit of different other laws in terms of right to farm and, and that kind of stuff. We do have the Farm Bureau sitting on our Rules Advisory Committee. Um, they're usually involved in those right to farm issues, and so hopefully they can advise us as well on that issue. It's typically done in a, in a situation like this is there are generations of seed that are produced. So you start with something called breeder seed or foundation seed, and there would be very specific isolation requirements for where that seed could be grown. And then as you go through the generations, those tend to ease up a bit, but oftentimes the commercial crop is not uh, harvested for subsequent seed use. And so you could have what would be called foundation registered seed, the certified seed would be sold commercially produced. So even there, if there were some small level of contamination, uh, it's not gonna carry into the next generation of the crop but we'd have to figure out what are the isolation distances that you need to have, and then it would be up to those people to work with their neighbors to make sure if they're producing early generation seed that they didn't have medical marijuana uh, in those areas to try to keep the, the THC under control. Well, lots of, uh, lots of interesting questions, lots of information, uh, some terrifically well-qualified people here. Uh, what we'd like to do is uh, start to wrap this up. I think maybe our friends would be willing to stick around for a minute or two if there were some specific questions you wanted to direct to them. Um, we want to express our appreciation for your being here and helping uh, sort of set the stage. I think it was a great uh, balance. I appreciate uh, uh, Hillary Barber from uh, our team uh, working on this. Uh, We anticipate that there will be more opportunities uh, both on, this, on the state and the federal level and make sure uh, that we have, if you want to be uh, up to date on what happens, we'll send out periodically some, uh, some email uh, notifications. So just sign up uh, to be uh, and indicate that you want to be involved. And we appreciate your taking the time today to sort of help us with this deeper dive and your questions, I think, help to clarify things as well. So, Thank you very much.